We are here today with Herman Senor, the Republican nominee for the 96th Illinois House seat in the November 6th general election. We appreciate you being here today and invite you to start by providing an opening statement about why you're running and why you feel you're the best candidate for this district. Okay, why well, I'm running, there's a, I'm running because I think there are, Springfield and Decatur are almost mirror images of themselves as far as the district that will be represented in the 96th. Um, the, mostly the east side of Springfield to the west side of Decatur and parts in, in between. Uh, you have to have knowledge of what the farming communities are doing because along I-72 there's a lot of farmland. But you also have to be uh, very familiar with the inner city uh, and how those workings are. And by being on the city council, I'm very familiar with the, the uh, workings of the uh, Springfield area. And uh, I know there's a gentleman in Decatur, Dan Calkins, who was previously a uh, council member in Decatur and he has uh, enlightened me on some of the things that are taking place or have taken place in Decatur. Um, a, a lot of things happening lately uh, involve young people uh, with nothing to do with shootings uh, and older people that are leaving our state. Um, I think those are two areas we, we can start in paying attention to and in between there your, your jobs and your pension costs um, that we need to, to, to pay attention in, and the biggest thing are school districts now. Um, uh, how, how are we going to fund the mandates that have been put out to address our school system, school districts? Uh, I, I think um, I would be a, a good candidate because um, I've grown up in Springfield. I've been to Decatur. Uh, I'm aware of the issues, and um, having served on the city council, uh, I think one of the biggest things is is your availability to people. Uh, sometimes just being there, listening to people helps them out, but, but being truthful. If you can do something, tell people you can do it. If you can't, then, then you can't do it. Uh, one of the big issues that we have now uh, that um, is uh, we've, uh, uh, our, the governor's trying to address is uh, we've had the same speaker for over 30 years in the House of Representatives, and, and that's one of the big topics is being term limits and also uh, taxes. So we have to find a way to bring all this together uh, increase our tax base uh, and bring people uh, back into or keep people in, into our state. All right. Um, as a candidate, you bring several unique perspectives to the job. You mentioned a few of them in your opening statement, but you're also a state employee. How has working for the state shaped your view of how state government is run? Um, having that perspective, which I'm glad you brought up, it, it gives me a, a, an end on how state workers are treated, how the system, uh, being an employee of DOT for the last, it'll be 30 years this coming November, uh, you're aware of the policies that are put forth and how those policies are, are implemented by the people in, in the various positions to implement them. Um, it gives you a perspective on how the people feel that the policies have been implemented on, how the employees uh, have been treated by both uh, uh, people in union positions and non-union positions. Um, there's a, uh, also being in, in city government, the city council, uh, you, you get to deal with a lot of issues that involved uh, people from all walks of life as far as people needing their sidewalk straightened up or needing grass cut and a lot next to them to uh, wire, what are we going to put on the wire block? So, you know, you deal with people in all those different aspects and you try to come to a conclusion uh, that's going to, uh, I realize that not everybody's going to be happy no matter what decision you make, but uh, we want to make the best decision for the whole city or whatever, in this case, the district of 96th district for the state of Illinois. Um, just to clarify, as a DOT employee, are you a union member as well? Yes, ma'am. I've been a union uh, member of union uh, Teamsters 916 for the past 20 years. Okay. You brought up being on city council as well. I think that would give you another unique perspective because you can see how the policies decided down the street affect you in City Hall and throughout the community. How would you use that to your advantage if you were elected to this seat? You know, there's, there's a place for everything in our society and if we can get it like a jigsaw puzzle, make the pieces fit per perfectly together. Um, and I think that the goal is to, whatever we do, make sure it, it improves the life and quality of the citizens of whatever, whether the district or the city of Springfield. You brought up uh, term limits this um, this morning. You were with Governor Bruce Rauner talking about taking uh, the People's Pledge. Yes, ma'am. I believe, which um, is a commitment to put term limits on state elected officials and um, to vote for anyone other than Mike Madigan for the House Speaker. What um, brought you there today to take that pledge? Well, I think it's very important that we get different perspectives. Uh, having the, the same Speaker been in office for over 30 years, uh, you get a perspective of someone that's that's been there and 
uh, dare I say, that sometimes we get set in our ways, the older we get. Um, we need, uh, as we know, our state's growing and changing, and, and we want to make sure that those changes are, are uh, representative of the people that are living here. Um, there's been a study done by RUDAT here in the, in the city uh, that shows that we have a decline in population, and, and what that includes is people living and dying, and, and there's more people that are, that are dying than are being born, but are, are, on to that, there are more people that are leaving the state and we're not replenishing them. So if we can increase our tax base, um, that would maybe help uh, one of the things of us lowering taxes because we have more people paying taxes. On term limits, what type do you support for um, you know, rank and file, legislative leaders? You know, should it be all people in the state house? Well, I think it'd be a rolling scale. Um, I think the uh, uh, representative would be a, a three-year term limit. Uh, and and a, a Senate leader uh, in, in the Senate, uh, I think there was a, a three three term limit, and um, I just think we don't need to get to a point where someone gets in there and, and, and stays, uh, which is where we currently are. Mm -hmm. So I do support terms. So should a legislative leader, like say the House Speaker, would that be on top of if they had served three terms in a row? You know, that's a very hard and interesting question. Um, uh, if, if you're in, in just a general representative Senate seat and then you move on to the Speaker's House, I think that should be a different. Okay, so also. leadership would yes, be an addition. Correct. And what kind of term limits do you see for leaders? Uh, in, in, the, in the specific leadership role, I, I think three terms would be, is, is plenty to serve to get your, your, your projects and your, your procedures implemented and to help uh, move, the, move the state forward. You, you mentioned, y'all, that the speaker, Mike Madigan, has been in for you know, um, many decades. Um, there are a couple Republican leaders in the House and Senate who have also been there 20 plus years. Do they suffer from the same issue of needing a fresh perspective there? Or? Well, I don't think anyone's been the leader of the House for 30 years, and that's what we're, we're looking at addressing. You had said um, you're a member of the union. I saw on your Facebook page you walked in some Labor Day parades. Do you consider yourself to be pro-union? Uh, well, the union has been very good to us. Um, I'm part of that as, as being in my job. Um, I, I support the uh, policies and procedures that our union has put in place. And, and there, there's a brotherhood that goes along with unions. Um, and uh, I, I do feel that unions have, have done our family very well. Okay. Um, Governor Rahner has been described by some union leaders as being anti-union. Uh, anti um, he, he has pushed to change rules related to things like prevailing wage and, and collective bargaining. Would you support the legislative agenda of Governor Rahner? You have to take each situation individually for what it is. And uh, I would have to look at each one of those situations individually and, and come up with a response to those, uh, each one in, accord, in accordance to what its merits are. But he's kind of broadly said that, you know, it's his view that public unions, public employee unions have too much power. Yeah, yeah and that, that's one of the, the, uh, one of the, the uh, areas that I, I differ with the governor on. And um, I've had talks with the governor and um, anybody that, that you're addressing or, or talking to, uh, you're not going to agree with them 100% on all the policies and procedures that, that they have. And, and that's one of the areas where I differ with the governor on. Um, when you announced last year that you were running for this office, you said you could support the governor for re-election, but you weren't sure if you could accept campaign contributions from him. Do you still support him for governor? I sure do, and, okay. and I have not, he has not offered, I have not accepted any campaign funds. You anticipated my next if, question. If you okay. look at my, uh, my opponent, she has uh, garnered well over $800,000 from Mike Madigan, and uh, for the, uh, uh, I think for us to have a fair shot, um, you know, I would not turn down any campaigns that the contributions that the governor would, would, would offer us. Turning to some of the issues you would face if elected to the to the House, um, we'd say the biggest one you, the, the, the legislature would be facing is the unfunded pension liability. So how would you propose the state go about addressing that? It's about $130 billion at least right now. Uh, I, I think I alluded to that earlier. We have to somehow increase our tax base, and we have to become make Illinois become a senior living community. Uh, and that's one of our biggest tax bases, our seniors. And if we could somehow uh, come up with procedures and, and living arrangements and uh, a lower tax base for our seniors to keep them here, 
that, that, way, that would increase our tax base and we could actually lower certain taxes in that respect, regard. Do you think that would provide enough revenue to, to completely fill that shortfall or? Well, no, because there's, there's not one thing that's, that's going to be a fix-all for all. Um, there, there have to be other procedures and policies implemented, but I think that would be a great start if we could somehow start working toward making Illinois a, a livable senior community. Uh, it, it would help us uh, get, get started in, in making an a impact on our, on our pension problem. What are some of the areas that we could do to be more friendly? Uh, and this kind of goes, I'm not pointing anything out, but um, we have to start making our, our parks and our homes and the businesses that we built uh, senior friendly. And what that means is in, in new construction, uh, making sure the doors are a little wider and the inclines are a little less pitched uh, and think, just making uh, things more accessible for seniors and maybe that would go to people with disabilities also would help them out. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, tax, you alluded to potential tax changes or fiscal policy? Yeah, if we could somehow, I'm not for, and I'm not for taxing pensions. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Let's get that off the table because uh, people have earned this money and it's been taxed before. Um, but, you know, I would have to sit down with some colleagues and find out what their, their areas are and, and get with them and get some of their ideas, but those are my ideas right now. Do you think the state constitution should be amended so that previously earned retirement benefits can be changed? No, ma'am, I do not support that at all. So then um, going forward, you know, one issue is paying the backlog we already have. Right. The other is trying to get ourselves in a better position for the future. What, how do you see the system needing to be changed? We're going to have to, when we have new hires, we're just going to have to sit down and explain to them that things can't be done the way they used to, they, they, they were done previously. Um, and let people know up front instead of trying to change it on the back end after they've already been hired. Uh, have an open door so that people getting into, to, when, and we're talking about state, uh, state jobs, to let them know that the uh, old pension system uh, way of doing business is gone and there's a new way because we have these problems and we have to fund these pensions and we have to find money to fund them and we just have to get other sources. And you know, sometimes that's going to require making hard decisions uh, and we're going to, we're so used to having things, having programs and procedures for us uh, and having them funded by publicly funded, but uh, we're just going to have to take some of those and, and, and move some of that money around so that we can start meeting these obligations. What kind of changes would you support for future workers, you know, people who have not already entered the system? Um, I, w I would have the, uh, uh, the choice of, of getting in the state pension system or having a, getting into a 401k program. Okay. Uh, that seems like the, the most likely to implement uh, and it, it gives them the uh, employee a choice and you know up front that okay whichever one you choose then this is a path that you're going to go down and this is what's going to be the effect of that when you retire. What about uh, compounding benefits? You know that compounding benefits is, is really hard because you have to have a, a if you're investing that money and, and it, it's invested in the right place, then of course your benefits are going to do good. But if, if the investments that you put that money into don't do well, then you're going to have a negative effect. So that's one of the uh, risks of compounding benefits. If you offer that, then you have to make sure that whoever is doing your investing is very smart, astute, and on top of things so that he can keep that money in a position where it's going to increase and your benefits will be compounded on a, in a positive manner because if you're using that system then if the benefits are positive then it's going to be negative it's going to have the effect that you don't want staying with pensions there's been an idea floated um, to move pensions for public school teachers to the school district as opposed to the state would you be in favor of that you know I, that's a hard question to answer because each district is if each district was set up the same, you know, you, you could answer that question in, in a blanket yes or blanket no. But since each district is separate, and, and for instance, like some of our school districts only have one school, and, and it's hard to uh, compare a district that only has one school that's doing well but with a district that has multiple schools that's not doing well. So I, I don't think that you can have a blanket answer to that question. Are there circumstances where you would favor it? Well, again, 
some of the school districts and a lot of, a lot of them are, are funded by uh, the property taxes. And if, again, going back, if a district is doing, school district is doing well, then they should maybe take other school districts under their wing and say, this is how we're doing it, and share those thoughts. And maybe if, if we had a system like that in place, that it would be beneficial to the state as a whole because then uh, sharing of information and maybe there's something that the small school district's not doing that the bigger school district is doing and if that's shared then it could be a positive for all the districts involved. The, um, the state's finances in general are in rough shape, have been for some time. Um, how would you work to change the financial traje trajectory of the state to get it on a uh, firmer fiscal standing? And, and can you tell me what time frame that you're, you're speaking of? Is it like two years, three years, four well, years, ten years? I think it's debatable if this state has ever had a balanced budget, like a truly balanced budget. I mean, clearly the budget impasse, and you saw that at city council, how the detrimental effects that had. Right. But, you know, generally speaking, you know, the, this state spends more than it takes in. Yes. It has for years. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to put a, I mean, I, I can't say forever, but it seems like. I guess what would be well, a short term, yeah. immediate things that need to be done, <laughs> then kind of the more medium and long term. Uh, I, I think, how do you address spending on uh, for projects that uh, some people seem or deem not necessary? And if I was elected, of course, I, I wouldn't take the uh, perks that come with traveling or, or the per diem because I live in the city. Um, and um, I would, um, that's, I mean, I'd have to look closely after that after I got elected to see what spending there is that's, and we all have our different definition of pork barrel spending. Uh, and take a look at those and see if there's anything in, in my district that I could cut out that we didn't need. And you know, I'd have to start with me. I don't want to say what somebody else should do because I don't know. You know, we each have to live with ourselves, and when we go home and go to bed, we have to live with the decisions that we make. And and I want to be comfortable with every decision I make, making sure that it's for the best interest of my constituents. Would you ever vote for a budget that was not, that was only balanced on paper, that was not balanced in reality? You know, again, that's one of those trick questions yeah. because you you don't know what all is involved in that when. When bills come out, they, there's so many riders that some people put on the bills and mm -hmm. uh, so many other things that go into affect it. Um, but I would try not to vote for a, a budget that was just balanced on paper. Are you in favor of uh, trying to roll back the income tax increase that was instituted? Uh, I think my opponent voted no originally on that, and then when it came to the floor, she voted yes. So she kind of flip-flopped on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not on... Uh, I, w I would not vote to increase any taxes if I, hopefully, uh, that would impact people and their livelihoods. And this this is one of those income tax. This is one of those taxes that impacts uh, people and it, it takes money out of their pockets. What the, the policies and procedures that I will support will uh, keep money in, in the in the people's pockets so that if they have more money and they can spend more money and it keeps our economy growing. If there were an effort to roll this one back to the I would previous. Vote, I would vote to, to roll that tax back. So if that happened, how does the state make up for the money that the increase generated? That's one of the tricky, tricky, tricky questions and tricky situations that we'd have to go into and, and delve into find those programs that uh, are unnecessary programs and we'd have to scale those back. And again, that goes back to what I said earlier. We get so used to having programs in place that are funded by the taxpayers. When one of those goes away, uh, we're not comfortable with that. Is there a specific program you have in mind, or no, ma'am? I have to, to to go and review okay. those and see which ones are uh, the most not needed. Um, given your answer right there, I'm gonna maybe predict your answer here. But there's a push from the Democrat um, the Democrats to institute a graduated income tax in this state. Do you think that would be um, a good move or a bad one? I think it will be a bad move because I've seen those commercials and I've heard uh, the gentleman uh, touting that graduated income tax, but he's never said what the percentages of increase or decrease that are going to be. And I can only, uh, um, I shouldn't assume, but he says that uh, he's going to tax the rich more. And uh, if 
if you're making more money than I am and you're, you're taxed at the same rate I am, then you're going to pay more than I am already. So I don't think that that's a very good idea, especially since he's not putting any percentages on what those rates are going to be. Um, one area that I, I've heard you talk about during this campaign is job creation. Um, you mentioned earlier the, the senior living area. What other areas of job creation would you like to focus on? Uh, for the young people, there, there used to be a project that we've had, uh, and a gentleman that uh, just retired, Reverend Hale, was instrumental in that, the Phoenix Project. And there were always seemed to always be summer jobs for youth. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, the Urban League had summer jobs. And uh, one of my first jobs was working for the city out at the, the lake on a riprap crew. And we went out and we cleaned up. So if we're creative, we can think of ways to, to in institute job programs for young people. And then, um, you know, there's other programs that I've been reading about where uh, you can get homeless involved. As you all know, we're, right now we're having a big problem with the homeless people in Springfield. And uh, one of the issues was they said get rid of them. But if you just get rid of them, you're just moving it to a different place. So I don't want to get creative and maybe employ them people and come up with some places where we can put some public showers and public bathrooms so that uh, and you, once you incorporate someone in, into the space where they're living, they tend to take ownership of that. And instead of them going to the bathroom and leaving things out in the open area, maybe they'll clean up and not let other people uh, defecate and do those things that are improper in certain areas. So do you think there should be a statewide job creation program for youth, or are you th thinking specifically in your district? Well, I think you have to start small and work it up. Okay. So if we can start in one area and, and, and get it going and, and, and uh, institute it and uh, maybe other people will like what we're doing and, and come and piggyback off of us and we can and make it spread on a broader scale though you know what what should the state be doing to encourage economic development encouraging businesses to see Illinois as a good place to come I think we have to, to, to market our state to say you know we're welcoming welcoming them of all types of businesses and uh, all types of, of people that want to come and do business in our state uh, and we have to, to show, highlight the areas that we have. Uh, Chicago is a, a great place, but sh Illinois is more than Chicago. You know, we have a lot of Lincoln sites here in Springfield. Uh, we have Cahokia Mounds down south that we have. Uh, we have the area over by uh, uh, Quincy. I forget what that is. But there's just more to Illinois than just Chicago. And if we start marketing our state as a whole, and getting people to come here and, and telling them all the good things that we have and, and what a great place it is to live. Uh, it's just about marketability. If you uh, win this um, seat in November, will you continue serving on the Springfield City Council until your term there is over in the spring? Uh, I, I would say I'll make that decision when, when it's time, but I, I think out of respect for the office, uh, when, when January 1st came, Come, rolls around, I, I would give the seat up so that I could get ready to start serving in the legislature. Okay. Um, if you did not win the seat, would you intend to seek another term on the city council? Uh, you know, we haven't crossed that bridge, and we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but we're, we're thinking positive, and we're, we're thinking we're going to move in the right direction and, and become a part of the state of Illinois in the 96th district. Anything else? Um, we thank you for meeting with us today, and we would invite you to give a closing statement, kind of uh, your elevator pitch, as to why you think you should be the victor um, on election night for this House seat. Uh, well, thank you all for having me. I think I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give you all a few words. And uh, I, I think I'm going to be the best candidate for the 96th Representative District because I'm accessible, I'm proactive. Um, I want to see both Springfield and Decatur grow, and I think there's a lot of possibilities that we have uh, in our area that we can highlight and market to make the, the 96th one of the best districts in the state of Illinois.